Thank you. Must be a water case. We have every all the seats filled. I welcome each and every one of you to the United States of America uh, versus Black Canyon Irrigation et al. et al. On behalf of the appellants, John Smeltzer will argue. Daryl Early will appear. Um, and as I understand it, Andrea, Andrew Waldera will appear. Thank you. And on behalf of the respondents, Michael Orr will argue for the state of Idaho. Michael Lawrence will argue on behalf of Suez Water Idaho, Water Idaho Inc. Christopher Meyer will appear. And I have another name there. Your Honor, I'm actually Daryl Early. Okay, Mr. Early. Okay, that was in the wrong spot and sincerely apologize, sir. Now, as you notice, Senior Justice Jess Walters is sitting in place of Justice Warren Jones, will participate fully throughout this, these proceedings. Any preliminary matters? Okay, sir. That's fine. We're all nervous, I will guarantee you. <laughs> Your Honor, this case is about supplemental water rights claims in the Snake River Basin adjudication for the Cascade and Deadwood Reservoirs in the Payette River Basin, Basin 65. The supplemental claims were made necessary and possible by computerized accounting procedures that were developed by the Idaho Department of Water Resources after the federal water rights claim or rights had been first licensed and treated. The accounting procedures adopted a new unconventional rule that all inflows into federal reservoirs are diversions for water rights purposes, whether or not those flows are stored and retained for beneficial use. The consequence of this unconventional diversion rule is that reclamation no longer has discretion as to how and when to fill the reservoirs. Historically, reclamation has deemed it prudent and necessary in light of the duty of care to downstream communities to fill the reservoirs in a manner that reduces flood risks and provides uh, a flood control for those downstream communities. Reclamation does this in years when there's excess water by passing and releasing some of the early flows to the reservoirs to leave space for when the peak flows come during flood season in order to be able to fill the reservoir during the peak flow season and therefore provide some flood protection. In contrast, under I, uh, IDWR's accounting procedures, reclamation can only use first available flows to satisfy its decreed rights. It makes it impossible for rec reclamation to both conduct its necessary flood control operations and fully exercise its decreed rights. Your Honor, the supplemental claims in this case that were filed by the United States do not challenge this result for purposes of the decree rights, which have priority dates of 1926 and 1937. However, since at least 1965, when these flood control operations were in full swing, and notwithstanding the newfound limits uh, imposed on the decree rights, reclamation has been filling the reservoirs in accordance with flood control considerations and beneficially using those last flows that come into the reservoir. The supplemental claims merely seek the opportunity to prove up those beneficial use rights in accordance with the new accounting procedures adopted by IDWR and the new diversion rule. In a related case, the district court acknowledged the merits of nearly identical claims that the United States filed for federal reservoirs in Basin 63. The district court dismissed the Basin 65 claims, not on the merits, but on the view that the supplemental claims in Basin 65 were precluded by a 1986 partial decree in the Pay of River adjudication. As illustrated by this court's decision in U.S. National Bank, or U.S. Bank National Association v. Kunstley, claim preclusion only applies to claims that actually were brought or could have been brought in a prior adjudication 
Before you go to the to the uh, preclusion issues, would you go back and readdress for me the the intersection between the, the uh, SRBA's Basin 63 decision and the de and the late claims here? Well, what I'm saying is in uh, the, the, the court's uh, orders in Basin 63, the district court has recognized that there's merits to the notion that the United States can beneficially use and have beneficially used the last flows into the reservoir. Were the Basin 63 claims late claims? Yes, they were identically filed. Basin 63, Basin 65, and two other basins at the same time. The two other basins were settled. The Basin 63 so were the 60 were the basin 63 claims late claims allowed um, they're still pending your honor they were, they were allowed as late claims as were the basin 65 claims were allowed as late claims of the srba the district court just then went on and determined they were concluded by the payday and are they at hearing officer level or at the srba district judge level um the basin 63 claims um they were, there was a decision on summary judgment that was, um, uh, summary judgment was, was not granted against the claims and they, they've gone back to the court. I'm not exactly sure what level they're at. So they haven't been finally decided. They haven't been decided on merits. They're arguing this issue. Yes. And they're, so they would be well, in front of a hearing issue. arts. They're not arguing a officer. specific issue in this case, which is the preclusion issue. Correct. Uh, but they are arguing the issue. That's what I'm trying to get to. We have, we have a uh, beneficial right in the late flows. Um, but they haven't decided that issue. That hasn't been decided. Okay. Um, and so what, what we're saying is crime preclusion doesn't apply in this case because before the change that was brought about by I, uh, or IDWPUR's accounting procedures, there was no reason or legal basis for the United States supplemental plan. And uh, uh, looking at this, we asked. This court to consider five um, different uh, points. Um, the first point I want to raise is just on the question of preclusion, what is the standard that applies? And we submit that the claim preclusion uh, inclusive of equitable limitations on that top standard is the applicable standard. The district court also uh, raised issues of issue preclusion and statutory forfeiture. As we explained in our uh, brief, uh, there really aren't three different preclusion theories to apply. There's just the one theory. The district court uh, relied on the other theories because the 1986 decree in the pay of adjudication affirmed rights as described in a 1979 director's report. In the 1979 director's report uh, referenced um, statutory forfeiture once a comprehensive uh, uh, decree would be entered into that adjudication. Um, we explained in our brief um, a couple of reasons why uh, the uh, those other issues don't apply specifically because the 1986 partial uh, adjudication in the Federal River wasn't uh, a final comprehensive adjudication of all claims, and therefore we don't think it triggered statutory forfeiture. But we're also here to tell the court that that doesn't matter today um, because, um, well, for two reasons. Um, first, the statement in the um, director's report, um, the 1979 director's report, that referenced forfeiture was simply a reference to forfeiture as provided under former section 42-11. So the statement itself has no force beyond the operation of the statute. And the second fundamental reason uh, uh, is that former section 42-1411 properly interpreted simply adopted the rule of claim preclusion uh, for the general adjudication. That follows from the plain terms of the statute, follows from uh, canons of interpretation from a precedent How do the um, final decrees in the Payette adjudication compare, for example, to the final unified decree that was entered in the SRBA? Um, I, it was similar. Um, Your Honor, obviously more limited in, in, in circumstance. Uh, uh, the final decree of the SRBA in this case exempted these, these supplemental claims. So that's not an issue with respect to the SRBA. Um, what we're saying with respect to the, the Payette adjudication is that uh, the, the there is finality to 
to that, but the finality doctrine comes with an equitable exemption for claims that could not have been brought because the circumstances changed. You could not have brought the, the claims that we're bringing now in the innovative education. Um, and so we should be allowed to present them here. And it's what we ask the court to, to consider with respect to that. Um, is is it a matter of could not or just didn't foresee it? Didn't uh, foresee the need? Uh, the standard is could not. It's not the standard in the bar of could you anticipate uh, a circumstance where facts have changed, the law would change. The standard is could you have brought them under the law as it existed at the time. That's the standard we're aiming at. And if addressing that standard, um, we ask the court to consider uh, my next four points. Um, so my second overall point is that the supplemental claims do not uh, assert rights for the appropriation of use of water in excess of uh, the decree rights. Um, the supplemental claims include the very same limits on water appropriation and use that are in the pay decree for the Cascades Desert Reservoirs. The purpose of the supplemental claims is not to expand the rights of use. Well, in the pay ed, you had 600,000 plus or something, correct? Right. Now you're asking for a million two? Right. And you're saying that's not an expansion? Right. How? Because the million two, the, the difference between what we claim and pay it and what we're claiming now is solely to allow us to run that water through the reservoir before we fill them up so we can use them for irrigation and power. Um, and what we're saying is Idaho changed the rules on us. Right? At the time of the pay decree, there wasn't a, a rule that everything that runs through the reservoir requires water. Now there is a rule that everything that goes into a reservoir requires water. And that's solely as a result of the county decision. So that what the purpose of but the you could have brought that. Don't you have a letter that says, uh, addresses this very issue? That the U.S. has right. previously made a, made a statement as concerns water flows? Isn't there a letter in the record? Oh, in the 1934 yeah. letter? Yeah. Um, yes, and thank you for raising that. There is um, there's a letter in the record that talks about second filling of, of, of reservoirs, and there's also some claims in the record that are cited in the state's brief page 21 and footnote 24 that refer to second uh, fill claims. Um, and there's a fundamental distinction between those claims and what we're doing here. And the distinction is this. It's conceivable, Your Honors, that you can have a reservoir, right? Say it's a capacity of 180 feet. You fill it up, then you use that 180 feet, beneficially use it for irrigation, um, stock water, whatever. Then you fill it up again and use it a second time. And if you can, during the season, you fill it up third time you use it to a third time for those beneficial uses that for which you have a right. In that circumstance, you might want to claim multiple fills because you're using multiple, um, you know, you're filling it up, using it, filling it up, using it, you're using the same water multiple times. That's not what's happening. We're talking about the ability to run the water through so we can fill the reservoir up one time. Right? So the refill issues in this case don't arise from the, from the ability or the desire to use more than we had the original right to use, it simply arises from the fact that we have to run the water through the reservoirs before we can fill them up to safely operate the reservoirs. Now, there is some aspect um, that, that refill operations, that there is a physical fill and an empty. We explain them, the whole process of that in our briefs, and that, that comes about because of the uncertainty, right? If, if, if reclamation knew at the beginning when they start filling up the reservoirs for the next season, how much flood water there's going to be, they could just run that amount through first and then fill up the flood water. But you can't know that. So what reclamation does is they just start filling without knowing, and they hold that water, and then when they find out how much space you're going to need, they release it from water. But ultimately, the, the process is the, the releases and the passing through, and it's ultimately all of our passing is for the same purpose, to leave that space and fill later in the season. And the supplemental claims are, are you know, they're claims for the beneficial use of Napoli water that we, that we use in years when there's uh, excess uh, water in the system. So explain why you could, why the U.S. could not have brought this claim. I, I, underst I understand why maybe you wouldn't have foreseen the need to do it. Right, but, the, but why could you not have? Because under conventional rules, right, you only claim diversions for what you're going to use, what you're going to store for that. I mean, that's the standard uh, water law, that um, you claim a right in respect to what you're going to beneficially use. And when it's a storage right, it's a right to storage for the beneficial use. 
identical use is ultimately what you're looking for. If you claim the right to divert that amount, that's the way these rights were uh, claimed all along. I mean, with the permits and the license. So, so. What, what, what happened was the way they reinterpreted the rules about water flows coming into the, the reservoirs, um, we now need to claim all the water in order to get to the back end. We couldn't have done that under a conventional understanding of water. We couldn't have come Did you object to that rule? We want that a million two, right? Because they're going to say, you're not that did you object to the rule in 93? I'm sorry? Have you objected to the rule in 93? Well, Did anybody object to the change in the rule? The, the 1993 was the first time that computerized were applied um, in this case. Now it's, it's 2017? Right. It's, it's been some time since, but please keep in mind that the, the 1993 accounting procedures were not a rule, they were not an order, they were an informal way of accounting for the water. They, you know, in, in, in 1993, IDWR never told the Bureau of Reclamation stop building the reservoirs, they always build the reservoirs, stop using the water rights, they always use the water rights. You just sent them you know, an accounting that said, well, you went over your rights because this is where you're doing our accounting. So, but, hold, hold on a minute. So, so, if I understand the argument then, uh, the United States could not have brought the supplemental claim at the time that it originally applied for its rights because it wasn't beneficially using the water, which is another way of saying that the decrees cover your use of the water. We're Black not, Canyon's position. We're, we're not saying we couldn't claim it because we weren't beneficially using the water. We're saying we could not claim it in the way that they're now requiring us to claim it because of the, the way that they're distributing water under the accounting system. We're always beneficially using but we're beneficially using the last flows in. Now they're saying under their accounting procedures, you can only have the first flows in. And that applies to our decree rights, the rights with uh, priority dates in 1926 and 1937. What we're saying is, okay, that's the rule for our decree rights. Please be mindful that we have been beneficially using the last flows in, right, since we started this uh, flood control operations. And you've changed the rules on us. You change the rules of how uh, water rights are described and defined in the federal law state reservoir. If we had known at the time of the Bay Decree, if there had been a rule, an accounting uh, rule or any rule of law uh, by statute or a case law, then we had to have a, a, a water right for everything that flowed into our reservoir, um, we would have described our rights differently at the time of the Bay Decree. Because we would have had to, because we would have had to find everything that came in in order to get to the water that we were, we were beneficially using. Since he's saying this, you know, the rules changed on us. We're trying to make the state happen. Right? So we're saying keep your procedures. You can have this rule. It's an unconventional rule, um, but it's a rule under which we can describe our rights, and we could have described our rights. This unconventional rule had been around since the beginning. So let us describe our rights in that way, and, and just show that we have beneficially used this water um, in, in the way. So your beneficial use is not changing. Nothing is changing. You're just adding 600,000 CFS. Not, nothing is changing except we need to um, re-describe our rights so we have the ability to run the difference through between the, you know, the 700,000 that's in our original decree right and the, the 1 million plus that we're now claiming um, in order to, uh, and that's for the, uh, I should say, for the uh, Cascade Reservoir, which is a different number, yeah. <laughs> for, for the Desert Reservoir. But we, we're just, we need to have that those additional numbers in order to necessary uh, uh, control work. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's really that simple. And the other change being that we were claiming that the new rights only um, uh, from the point that we actually use this one. Right? The, again, the, 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 the um, decree rights go back to 1926 and 1937. It took, it, it took a while for the red bars to be built. A while for us to start filling the reservoirs, it took a while for reclamation to realize what the impacts were and the different ways of filling. So, beginning in the late 1950s, when the reservoirs got up to speed, that's when reclamation started the flood control operations in 1965, which is the date of the supplemental claims. This is a year when we had maximum flows through, through so it was a good year to, to use um, for the accounting purposes to 
to, to just decide um, the level uh, of, the, of the rights. Um, but again, what, what we're doing is just um, adding those additional amounts to the diversion uh, line items sort of the description the rights because we need to run the water through the reservoirs to safely operate the reservoirs and fill up the reservoirs. And so let me uh, get to, to one last point before I sit down so I can reserve uh, my rebuttal time. Um, the, the state and Sue West object um, to the claim from the theory that, well, gosh, if we give the United States these greater rights, um, the United States is going to control all the water to any degree um, to generate another water. And that's not people that remain to the um, race to the arguments, but it's also not true. Um, there's going to be absolutely no injury in senior users because the United States has to pass on that water to senior users. And by senior, I mean anybody with water right before the new priority date of the supplemental plan, which is 1965. As far as junior users go, anybody who acquired the water right in water after we started these um, uh, flood control operations necessarily uh, acquired rights in the waters that we were releasing, right? we were passing and releasing um, before we built up the reservoir. But all of those waters are still going to be available at the same time, they're still available for appropriation. Nothing has changed. Uh, Does the record show, is, is there any place I can go to to understand um, who these end users are, how many there are, the, the acres that are involved, the municipal uses, what, you know, that I can get a sense of? Um, well, the uses of the water that we're storing in the reservoir um, uh, principally are Black Canyon Irrigation District and some others. But is there any place in the record that describes this? I'm not sure that there's much in the record about what other junior users might be there. Or, or even uh, not necessarily junior users. Well, one of the senior users is the Black Canyon uh, hydropower dams, the Ledger Dam. We're allowed to pass the senior users according to the accounting procedure, so that's not really an issue. What's it, what, if the alleged allegation is that we're being injured to junior users, I don't think any senior users that. What I'm trying to explain is that uh, given that we're not changing the way the, the reservoir is filled, recognizing the supplemental rights for us to use the last 10 waters is not going to change anything with respect to your users. We're still going to have access to all of that water that we have to be excess, uh, as Justice Burdick talked about, above what we're doing for use uh, in our rights is still going to be available for your users in the same way it's been available since 1965, since we started doing has the U.S. filed a Rule 60B motion? Thank you, sir. Um, as I understand it, Mr. Orr will argue. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You're first. Hold on a second. You, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. And and then slow slow down because I'm a I'm slow. Yeah, right. Yeah. Three different proceedings. So is this one? There is a similar uh, well, similar link claims have been filed in the case of by the U.S. by the United States. There are also some by some irrigation entities. Uh, and what happened there was a special master who ruled a high summary judgment motion there. The district court uh, rejected the special master's decision and sent those late claims back to the special master for resolution of remaining summary judgment issues and also a decision on merits if, if they get to that. Third proceeding is a uh, judicial review proceeding under the Iowa Administrative Procedures Act to review IDW 
OER's accounting system in Basin 63. That uh, proceeding has generated several emails that were pending before this court when we heard in January, I believe. But they're not necessarily getting those. And when Mr. Smeltzer refers to, well, the district court already said those Basin 63 claims of claim to have merit, it's ignoring the fact that the district court made this such a rule set the back to the special master and that's what given the impediment. Now we also know we have a record in this case about a question about how these late claims would actually affect other water right holders, how they will affect the administration. Mr. Smeltzer again made a lot of uh, assertions about that, but this, this came up for so much we really don't have a record on that that needs to be developed in an evidentiary sense if the conclusion does not apply. <coughs> So in other words, if we were to reverse the decision, it would be with a remand to then determine, I suppose, if the late claim should be allowed on other grounds or disallowed on other grounds? Possibly. There are also pending summary judgment issues that the special master did not address that would have to be addressed before we even got to that question, just like in Basin 63. So in other words, our ruling today would not mean that suddenly the claims would be allowed. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot more to this story. That is correct. Uh, another question, or another thing I'd like to uh, address is uh, council's representation that uh, somehow uh, IBWR is telling them not to fill the present quarters. There's nothing in the record to that effect. I've never heard anything like that before. Um, I think essentially what that is, is just, again, an objection to how the Accounting is done. The accounting is prior to the administration. It's not reservoir operations. Those are two entirely different things. Say that again. The accounting system is a tool, an administrative tool, for prior to the administration of water rights, decree, and license under Idaho law. Reservoir operations are a different matter. They are federally controlled. They're not driven by accounting or even by state water rates. When the, when the United States operates the rest of these reservoirs, it does it based on federal guidelines and how it decides to these top rate reservoirs. And, you know, those purposes are not free water rates. The director, nonetheless, has to still administer the water rates, and that's part of what the accounting system is there to help you do. But what about this assertion that you've changed the rules? Yes. Did you? No, and I think Council actually admitted that. I heard him say, well, the accounting system is just a default procedure. It doesn't establish any rules. And that's absolutely correct. It does not. The accounting system is an administrative tool that the department uses to determine when water rights have been satisfied from a federal administration standpoint. So are we talking then about semantics, about what is a rule? I mean, is or I guess what I'm really getting at is, is has the way that the department manages the water changed, it, it, affected them, affected no, the state? No, it has not. Okay. What, what council is referring to is the fact that in 1993, the department began to pursue the water pursuant to the And the accounting system did not define those water rights. It did not change those water rights. It did not define prior appropriation principles and did not change them. Those types of things are defined by water rights decrees, by statutes, by the decisions of the support. The accounting system is simply an administrative tool. And that's why, well, in, in, in general adjudication such as the pay ads, that's why it's incumbent on a water right uh, claimant. And at that point in time, anything and everything that they believe may be integral to the nature, extent, or future administration of the rights. Because that decree will be inclusive, binding, and governing in the future, regardless of what type of uh, accounting or administrative system is in place or will be adopted in the future. So, in a general stream adjudication, you have to claim everything that you think may be integral to the rights. In this case, it's undisputed, as I think some questions indicated, that in 1993, well, before the bad adjudication, actually, the United States had been operating the rest of the forces, had been doing flood control, and that had an impact on the United States. It's 
decided to actually store water for elephants and space holders. So that could have been claimed uh, in, in the data education both as a matter of law and as a matter of foresight. So in this case, it was not, and the conclusion applies. Now, the United States argues that the, uh, the so called uh, Hughesley exception to race judicata applies um, as a result of the uh, accounting system. And it says that uh, simply by invoking Hughesley, the United States has transformed the question of whether the accounting system actually is contrary. Or actually, it does reinterpret the band degree into a purely legal question that this court could resolve in this video. And that's contrary to uh, this court's decisions in the Jason White 17 case in the New York Baltimore Court District No. 2 case. In both of those cases, this court made it clear that if the challenge is to administration, that in most cases that's going to be because we mix the question of law and fact by definition. But in any event, it is subject to the requirement, statutory requirement, of exhaustive administrative remedies. And then any judicial review of IDWR's decision must be brought forward under the Iowa Administrative Procedures Act. Coonsley is not an exception to those holdings. It's not an exception to the Iowa Administrative Procedures Act. Coonsley doesn't even really apply here because it's a right in this case. And uh, the Coonsley claim was not right in the first litigation, and that's why it was not precluded. But the late claims here, and the district court laid this out very clearly, I think, by their very nature, were right in 1965 uh, because they were are expressly based on beneficial use. If you look at the late claims, they're in the record, there's nothing about that account. They are based on beneficial use, expressly on the basis of claims. And use is asserted to have occurred in 1965. That means that in this court's decisions, as a matter of law, the link claim for right in 1965 could have been claimed. So, Kuzma doesn't apply. And as, as I mentioned, it's undisputed that the United States had political operations in this method of storage, whatever it is, in place long before the payment education is initiated. Further, this court uh, also explained the case of my 17 decision. The United States has a remedy in the belief that IDWR's accounting system is flawed. It, it can bring those objections before the treasurer, and uh, if necessary, it can file for a petition for judicial review on the Idaho uh, Administrative Procedures Act. Which is the posture of 63, correct? That, well, the 63 accounting system. Right. Yeah, there's two things happening. In January. Now, the district court did not hold, we have not argued that the United States accounting objections were precluded. They could have brought them in 1993. They could have brought them in connection with their SRPA claims on the previous 83 rights. They could have brought them yesterday. They could still bring them today. There's nothing that, in this case, that's going to prevent that from happening. But under the Idaho Code, and this court's decisions, challenges to IDWR's water administration are not a basis for making a redetermination of the nature and extent of previously agreed water rights. Is Rule 60B a remedy, for, a, a potential remedy for the U.S.? And, uh, uh, Justice Brennan, the district court also brought this up in its decision. He did, uh, the district judge did mention that, I think he said the story might have been different. Under Rule 60B motion. And the, uh, the United States would like any more aware of the potential for Rule 60B motion long ago, back in 2012, when this whole thing got started, at least by 17, but that's not the course they chose. Now, what they're trying to do here, as I understand it, is use a late claim sort of as a 60B motion, but that would render 60B superfluous for water and education. It would circumvent the standards and uh, procedures under that rule. Further, in, in 1993, as now, IDWR was required to administer water rights pursuant to water rights decrees. Uh, 
charters and contentions of the decrees included uh, entitlements or administrative provisions of the Great Union Army. What the United States is arguing here is chain argument. It's actually an attempt to reinterpret the pay act. There's nothing in the pay act that awarded the quantities required in which to keep here. There's nothing in the pay act decree that authorized uh, administration based on flood control operations rather than priority. And uh, even outside of that, any claim that the pay act decree endowed the United States with these types Rights could have and should have brought the SRBA when they filed claims based on the payout decree. That was also possible. And briefly, with respect to the uh, United States' other arguments on the payout decree, as we pointed out in our brief, there are a lot of arguments that are related to the questions that the court asked during the meeting. I'd just like to point out that, as we discussed in our brief, none of this was raised in the district court proceedings. Before the special master or before the district judge, the only argument regarding the conclusion that any party made was based on QSA. All these other arguments have been raised for the first time in this appeal, and the district court's decisions that waived. Now, in, his, uh, in the district court's second ruling, interest of jurisdiction. He said the special measure exceeded the narrow scope of late claims and the jurisdiction of the SRBA by taking up Black Canyon's argument that the late claims were, quote, not necessary, allegedly because they collect water that was, quote, already appropriated under by the Water Rights Decree and the SRBA in 2003. By its terms, this was a purely jurisdictional ruling. The United States here has made an attempt to characterize it as a substantive ruling on the validity or the legality of the water district system by the economic system. And I submit that's simply contrary to the language of the district court's order. He, like Canyon in his brief, uh, admitted that it was a jurisdictional ruling to get to the merits, as we pointed out in our brief. The reason the United States makes this argument is to, uh, is to use this appeal as a vehicle for resolving these objections to the economic system. Or to relitigate the nature and extent of the Greek security water rights. But under the decisions of this court and the Idaho Code, the United States objections and challenges to IDW of accounting methods must be presented to the director first before seeking any judicial relief. And that relief must be sought under the administrative These requirements cannot be circumvented by a simple expedient raising a constitutional claim or by alleging an administrative issue such as diversions versus appropriations is a purely legal question that can be decided here in this video. The district court was correct in that the experiments are beyond the scope of the white claims in the jurisdiction of the SRBA. One last comment, uh, your honors. The distinction that uh, the United States draw between priority diversions, priority appropriations, or use their justification for saying, well, we need to claim more water now. We agree that Idaho law at the time strictly limited the amount of water you could divert under priority to the amount you actually use. That's still the rule today. It was recently uh, reaffirmed this court's equipment decision last year. That is the limit of the priority right. There is nothing in the accounting system that does or even can change the water rights or prior appropriation. The director is not the authority to do that. It's a completely administrative tool. And any challenge to that must be brought up appropriately in the driving based mindset. Would there be any wisdom in this court delaying the ruling on this case until after the 
based on 63 cases heard? Your Honor, I, I don't think so. This, this case presents some straightforward legal questions of inclusion and jurisdiction. They, uh, whatever happens in the D.C. 63 county case, what we're hearing on that, uh, those standards, those legal issues are clearly defined. As the United States, depending uh, on the outcome of that case, decides, well, we've got something here, we can use this to uh, bring our objections to the director, they can still do that. There's nothing that but what we're talking about here at the end is the finality of the previous issue of the SRBA. As we pointed out in our brief, this arises on a regular basis. There are, it's not unusual, I think the district court said this happens a lot, that people are coming back in saying, wait a minute, I know the decree says this, but I want them to administer it this way. Well, those are two different things. Water management and water adjudication are two different, two different things. And the decrees are final. And we undermine finality if we go, go down the road that the United States wants to take here. And one other thing I'd like to add. But how, how do you deal with that? I mean, how do you deal with a situation where rights are decreed, everybody thinks they understand how the water is going to administer, be administered? The water gets administered for 25, 30, 40, maybe 50 years. And then all of a sudden, um, you have a change in how the water is administered, and you see a disconnect between the right that got decreed and the way that the water has been administered historically and the way that it's being administered today. How do you deal with that? I mean, the water users justifiably saying, you know, how do you deal with this decree that, that everybody knows, everybody thought they understood what it meant, and suddenly it doesn't mean anything? like what the parties thought it meant. Well, Justice Brewer, there's, a, there's several, several ways that I was going to say that. First, you could file a time in Rule 60B motion, which the district court pointed out was going to be available to them all along, and did not. So but practically speaking, with the SRBA, isn't the normal tact that if it's a, if it's a, um, if it's objected to, if there are other people who, who say no, we're not going to reopen this, that you can pretty much forget the Rule 60B remedy? I think the Rule 60B standards can be at times a little steep, but they're there for a reason. And that doesn't change the fact that in general adjudication, the claimant is required to claim everything that they believe is integral to the nature, extent, or future administration of the rights. That's the purpose of the of general adjudication. That's why it becomes final. And after that, if there's a disagreement over whether the administration is actually matching what was claimed and decreed, then there's a remedy under the Iowa Administrative Procedure Act. That's the way the Iowa Code and this was set out. And if we go down the other road, there's no such thing as final adjudication. And the decrees become essentially meaningless. It's whatever anybody decides to argue uh, the sort of practice that should be done. We need, we need to have these things decreed. Thank you. Have they used their entire 30 minutes? No, Just the 20? Okay, thank you. Good morning. Uh, may I please record? My name is Michael Lawrence. I'm the Kids First League LLP, representing the Farmers U.S. Water IO Inc. Some of you may know, formerly known as U.S. Water. Uh, seated with me uh, at the uh, council table today is Chris Meyer, my partner. Uh, the first subject I'd like to address with the court today is, is to explain why Suez is here. As you all know, Suez supplies municipal water to thousands of customers in the greater Boise area. That's Basin 63. Uh, in this case, of course, involves Basin 65 lake claims. Well, the reason, in short, why Suez is here is because uh, Suez, Suez has been long concerned that decisions made on this refill issue in other basins may come and uh, be precedential or somehow affect Suez's interests in Basin 63. Uh, 
Suez is, I understand it, the largest uh, municipal water provider in the state. It has a large portfolio, over 100 uh, water rights, some many groundwater rights, but also service water rights and storage water right environments in the Wilson River that are most freshwaters. Uh, at times, up to about a third of Suez's supply can uh, be made up of surface water, treated surface water, diverted from the Boise River. Uh, some of Suez's surface water rights are senior to the federal onstream reservoir water rights, some of them are junior. And sometimes they're supplied by storage and time as I mentioned before. So, in short, Suez looks at these issues from multiple perspectives, not simply as a junior uh, surface water user or senior or storage water user, but several perspectives. Now, Suez has been involved in this huge refill controversy since Basin Y17 all the way up through the appeal of this court. Uh, and as has already been mentioned, there have been other proceedings around the state, uh, late claims filed in other basins, basin 1, SRBA, late claims in basins 1, 2137, 6365, and 8365 at that issue today. Also, the contested cases brought by the director concerning the administration of uh, federal on stream storage water rights uh, in basin 1, and basin 63, not here in basin 65. As we've already been discussed. Well, way back when all this was going, the U.S. didn't know, or when I got started, the U.S. didn't know if these issues would be finally determined in Basin Y17 in any of the various late claim proceedings in either contested case by the director. So it's not involved in all. And lo and behold, here we are today because this is the proceeding, Basin 65 is the proceeding where late claims came to this court. Basin 63, of course, as already been mentioned, uh, is where the contested case appeal is occurring. So that's why Suez is here. Suez is concerned that a determination made by this court and this proceeding concerning Basin 65 late claims could affect its interest in Basin 63. Now, for that matter, that may not be the case because this issue of the late claims in Basin 65 should be, in Suez's view, determined on the basis of res judicata on the late claims being barred by the prior adjudication. Suez agrees with the state that these late claims could have been and should have been brought through prior adjudication. Uh, they weren't. All of the facts and circumstances necessary to bring those claims existed. Obviously, these are pre-1971. Constitutional method water rights being claimed in the late claims. That means the facts giving rise to such claims would be diversion beneficial use. They're claiming in 1965 priority date. If the diversion and beneficial use of water had actually occurred as alleged in 1965, obviously those circumstances, those facts arose in 1965. Those claims, those facts existed in 19, uh, during the pay adjudication. Uh, and they could have been, these claims should, could have been and should have been brought up day one. Uh, it's been uh, discussed here today as to whether there was a change when the department implemented uh, the, its accounting system in the 90s. That, that, was, that was not a change to how the water rights uh, were administered. That was, in my, my understanding, first time that the water rights were actually administered. Prior to that point, there had been no year-round administration of the storage water rights. And so the United States is essentially arguing that, well, that's, that's what they were entitled to assume would happen for the rest of the time. That's why they didn't claim the late claims in the pay adjudication, because, well, they've been free of administration the whole time. Well, why would we think that would ever happen? Well, as Mr. Orr already discussed, it's incumbent on water rate claims and general stream adjudications to bring all, they, all the claims that they think they could possibly have to create. If not, those claims, those water rights uh, will not exist once the, uh, once the adjudication concludes. And Suez fully agrees with Mr. Orr's comments concerning the finality of the decrees. And Justice Brody, 
Uh, Ray raised, a, raised a, a good practical point about well, what does this mean? Because it is happening in places around the state. Uh, Judge Wildman uh, referenced it uh, during the hearing. Uh, folks have their decrees from the SRBA. And now water districts are being set up. And administration is occurring. And people say, well, the decrees, that those don't really reflect what we used to do. Well, that was the point of the adjudication. This memorialize how who owns what water rights, what water rights look like. And if there are historical practices, if there are uh, additional claims that could have been and should have been brought, so everybody's rights are administered the way they used to be. That was incumbent on, on parties to the general adjudication to bring those claims and have them determine during that general adjudication. And it's, it's, it's harsh. There is 60B. Perhaps if there is some uh, issue, uh, a party could try to reopen the finding of the five degree and convince Judge Wildman uh, to, to take a second look. That if, is an uphill battle. Are you, are you aware of any decisions where Judge Wildman has granted a Rule 60B motion in an objected to case? I am not aware of that. I, I have to admit, I'm not fully aware of all of the um, uh, all of the proceedings where people have come back to the SRBA court and asked Judge Wildman to take a second look. I, I do know that he has on occasion granted second looks and, and I, I understand has fixed some clerical errors and some other things. Uh, but I, I, I don't know, I, it's my understanding that he's quite reluctant to reopen and make these, these old decrees. Since folks had a, a full and fair opportunity to have these matters litigated during the 27 years that the SRBA was pending. Finality is important. That was the whole point of the adjudication was to figure out what these water rights were so we could administer water rights. And, it's, uh, it's uh, of course, difficult to imagine if folks were allowed to come back to court and second guess it, but how, how administration would uh, logically or efficiently proceed. Uh, I also wanted to quickly, before I run out of time here, address uh, another point made by Justice Brody, and that was whether the late claims, should they not be barred by res judicata uh, or the adjudication or any of the uh, various arguments by the bar, whether they need to be remanded, whether there's more work to do, could they simply be decreed? And Justice Burdick's question about what's going on with basis 63 late claims, they are still pending. Uh, there is more work to do on all of them. Uh, the problem is, as far as I know, there have never been water rights to create like these in the state of Iowa. And there are substantial questions as to what these rights might look like. We're not even sure of all the questions to ask about what these rights might look like. I mean, all the evidence that should be put on to prove up such rights. It's not as easy as saying. But that doesn't that go exactly to their argument? I mean, their whole point is, before now, we decreeing these types of, of fill rights wasn't uh, wasn't part of the equation. I mean, it seems to me it feeds their position exactly. Well, I, 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 I disagree respectfully disagree with this, but I don't think it does support their position. Uh, the fact that they hadn't uh, tried to have such rights decreed doesn't, that, that's, that's the answer to their question. They didn't even try. They didn't even try in this proceeding to prove up these claims. It's theoretically, it's conceivable, we agree, to prove up late claims. We just don't know exactly how to do it. There are substantial questions to be asked and answered, whether, uh, whether the, uh, the diversion of beneficial use of water under these late claims uh, was already perfected or done under an existing right whether uh, these late claims uh, have been abandoned or forfeited. You notice since at least 1993 there hasn't been priority refill. 
So let's say, let's assume for sake of argument that they existed at one point. Well, since 1993, they haven't existed. There's been no private control. I've run out of time. I apologize. Uh, I will talk Thank you. Thank you. And how much time does the appellant have? Yeah. Sir? start with the uh, state's argument that there was no change in law because these were just accounting procedures. I mean, first stipulate that when they were just accounting procedures, that there, there wasn't a natural change in law at that point. It was just it's, it's paper accounting. The problem with that argument, though, of course, is that the, the accounting procedure is, is premised on an understanding of law. Right? The accounting procedure introduces this unconventional notion that any time you have water and water into a reservoir, you need a water, you need a, a permit or, or a duty of water right in order to have that happen because it's a diversion for purposes of, of, of water rights. And that um, is a, a, a determination of law that is before this court um, in a different case, but that this court will hear in January, and that's the, the case, the APA challenge, I don't think the APA challenge is based in 63 County. And that's you know where they set out where the Idaho Department of Water Resources sets out its legal theory for, for why this makes sense. And this court's going to review that legal theory. And then once this court reviews that legal theory, if this court says yes, you can do that, that makes sense. That's going to be a rule of law, and then the, the rule of law will, will have been affected. Right? The SRDA was in. So we needed to file our, our claims to get it in based on, you know, it wasn't a final change in So the, the issue is there's no more water. Right? Correct? There's no more water. It's a cycle. There's no more new water. Yeah. yeah, okay. So the issue is, what if Colorado comes up with a new theory of water management? Does And it's brought to the SRBA, and we said, well, we never thought of this. Therefore, we need a water right. Our water right needs to change for Colorado's new theory. Where's the finality uh, in terms of a general adjudication? If there is no more water, you got 700,000 of it, now you want 1.2. Well, well, that's the point, Yeah. We don't want, we want 700,000. We just want to be able to, to get our 700,000 that we have in our permit the same way we've been getting But it. in the it's first instance, you said you use it for flood control, correct? It's not used for flood control. Okay. Flood control is not a use of water. We're just running it through the way. Yeah, right. Water. We're not using the water. There's no law on that. There's no rule of law in Idaho that that's a water use of additional use that requires a permit. And we're not storing water for flood control. We're letting the water run through the reservoir for flood control. But then you and get 500,000 more CFS of <laughs> something. We don't get to use it. We're not asking to use it. We don't get to use it. And it is, it's a very unconventional understanding of, of water rights. Because if it's it, unconventional, appeal that. Why don't you do that? Well, you're As right, opposed to come in and get new water rights. Sure. And we had a choice. I mean, presumably, um, and let me step back, the, uh, the Idaho proceedings, we did not participate in the APA proceedings because we felt there was an inherent in that issue. Whether we're right or wrong on that, that's why we did. But Could we you explain that to me? What was the McCarran issue that precluded you? As from... counsel said, it wasn't a uh, general, it's not part of the general adjudication. Okay, I get it, we, we I get it. The general You're right, exactly right. Um, not otherwise. Um, yes, sir. But, but in any event, as I understand it, and that it goes to another point that counsel raised, that, um, that we're somehow challenging the procedures, we thought we had a choice, right? And we understood this course ruling from the basic point seventeen. Um, decision to say that the Idaho Department of Water Resources has broad discretion to, to come up with rules as to how to distribute the water. And that, you know, we, there's, there's a possibility, of course, that in the basic 63 proceedings that the, the diversion rule, while unconventional, could be upheld. As, as I explained in the first part of my uh, remarks, that it's not a rule that's, that's crazy if we understood it from the outset to the minor rules around the, that that understanding of what constitutes a diversion, what you need to have stated in the permit, but that just wasn't there. But we're not challenging, the supplemental plans are not challenging the rule, right? We're, we're accepting that diversion rule. We're articulating the new in accordance with the diversion rule, and we're giving up on the priority dates of our original decree rights. We're saying, okay, the 1926 and the 1937 decree rights 
um, will have to be, if the this county receives this understanding of the law and so help, will have to be determined in accordance with that. What we're saying is, look, we've been beneficially using the last water under Idaho law. If we started doing it before 1971, we got a right under the Idaho Constitution in order to do that. That has never been presented to this, this court because it didn't have to be, because it was always assumed within our decreed rights until the rule changed. So, you know, that's, that's the only Until they started administrating it. Well, until they came up with rules in, in as part of their distribution rules, saying you must take first flows, that's the only way you can satisfy the decreed rights. Until the Idaho Department of Resources said that, based on a legal theory that could be upheld in this court, right, there, there wasn't an idea that you need a permit to run water. I want to address Justice Brody's question about Rule 60 b As I understand, Rule 60 b is a procedure for coming back and reopening a final agreement. Well, and one thing you, I wrote it down when you said it. You said we want to re-describe our rights. Right. And, and so I guess that's. No, I understand. And, and I guess all I want to say with respect to Rule 60 b is the SRDA wasn't over. And the pay adjudication wasn't over either. The pay adjudication was folded into the SRDA. And we had to refile our pay adjudication claims in the SRPA. And they, there wasn't a final decision in the SRPA at the time we brought our supplemental claims. The supplemental claims are very similar to Rule 60B. They're based on the same equitable understanding that you change the rules uh, after you know, uh, sort of your, your legal rights have been articulated. That, that's a judge that really gives you an opportunity to come back to the court. You the said, we, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, the reason we went with the supplemental claims is is we had the ability to do that because the SRDA was still ongoing. And we thought that was the right procedure because we didn't have a final decree. But you had, a, you had a partial decree with a 54 certificate, correct? Yes. Correct. And everyone has gone, and the law says that if you don't appeal that, it's final. Is that correct? Yeah. All that's true, but none of that takes away from the, the general rules of finality that if something changes, allowed to come back and bring a new claim right that's, that's predicated on circumstances that are different. And, and and that's what we've done. Uh, I, I understand there might be you know second guessing about the legal tactics the United States use. You can say well, well we could have gone and challenged here we could have brought a different kind of procedure. If the question before the court is this procedure the water right is defined by problem. statute is it not? Sorry? The water rights of of well, Idaho are defined by statute and they're their elements. I guess there are statutory, there's a statute that governs the, the procedure now for um, uh, applying for acquired rights, and there has been for years. Of course, when we originally acquired our rights um, for these reservoirs, we complied with the Idaho permit process. And if you look at the original license, right, and this is what our rates, um, they're exceedingly broad. They say we have a capacity, they acknowledge the license, they say that we have this capacity for the uh, the Cascade Reservoir, we have 700,000 acres of capacity. And they say we have a right to beneficially use that 700,000 acres. That's what we're asking <laughs> to still do today. Our supplemental claims don't change any of that. It's perfectly consistent with what we originally decreed or granted by the state engineer uh, when, when the license was, was certified. Um, you know, all that's changed is they come up with a new idea about water flowing into the residence, which has changed and added, and I should, use, should also add about the license you go to them, they say there's nothing about a temporal limit to fill up the residence. And all of this sort of depends on when you find it, when you start filling it, whether it's even a reason. Right? There's nothing at all. The limit is the use of which you can appropriate and use. And all we're asking for is the ability to store physically in the reservoirs the amount that we were originally granted. And what we're saying is the uh, the practicalities of these uh, of this water basin, the pay river water basin, is such that the dynamics of the system are to safely operate this um, system for the reservoirs, consistent with the duty of care to downstream uh, users, that we can't fill the first available flows that we have. And we're not entering anybody, we're just asking people to enjoy Thank you. This matter is now under advisement. We'll render a decision. Be back in a few minutes for round two.